let me do this question. It says uh, two blocks are connected by a massless rope as shown below over a pulley that my <laughs> other portion of the question image is uh, um, obscured. The mass of the block on the table is 5.4 kilogram. Okay, let me just write it down. So M1 is 5.4 kilogram. And the hanging mass is 0 0.6 kilogram. Oh, we have a lab that looks almost like this. Uh, so you'll see it in lab. Uh, the table is frictionless, the pool is frictionless and massless. Both parts are actually important. That allows you to say a certain thing that you can't otherwise say. It says find the acceleration of the blocks, the tension in the rope, and the speed with which the hanging mass hits the floor. Oh, I didn't need to have this here. They already asked. <laughs> which is fine um so okay so this is uh, as you read through it i hope you get a sense um, other than the fact what chapter the question is from i hope you get the sense that this is the kind of question that involves force analysis so once you figure that out you should be going through the standard strategy it almost doesn't matter what specific question the question asks you once you realize it involves a force analysis then standard strategy is what you should be using. Uh, it's the four steps that we lay out. You draw free body diagrams. And in this case, it'll be diagrams, more than one. And you need to define a coordinate axis. And to be clear, after you've drawn free body diagram, all these steps you will have, it'll be for each diagram. You don't have to define the same coordinate axis for it. Uh, all the diagrams. So sometimes it's uh, convenient to, to define different uh, axes. Step number three, you have to break forces into components. Sometimes you don't need to do. I get a sense of here we can skip this step, but I'll write it down so that I don't forget in other cases. And once you've drawn step number, uh, once you've finished the step number three, then you should have all the information annotated in your free body diagram where you can simply reference it to write down the Newton's second law equations, which says acceleration is the net force divided by mass of the object that you drew a free body diagram for. So let me move this off to the side so that I have some space to use here. So let me uh, start by drawing free body diagrams. So I'm going to need a free body diagram of mass 1 and I need to draw a free body diagram of mass 2 separately. So I'm going to make sure I have two separate dots. I don't mix them up as I draw uh, forces on these, uh, on these masses. So as you think about the, what kind of forces can be on these objects, uh, the, one of the things that helps is the gravity. Gravity is going to be there almost always unless um, something in the question specifically makes you think, oh, there's not going to be any gravity, unless it's that, which is very rare, uh, you'll always have gravity. I like having this as the first uh, force I draw because drawing gravity allows you to think about what other forces you need to draw so that the overall net force you get is consistent with the direction of acceleration that you have some sense of. So um, M1, you see that it's uh, sliding only horizontally. So vertically, there can't be any net force. So there must be an upward force which will balance out gravity and make sure that it's not slide moving up or down. Normal force is the support force that does that. And if you end things here, I hope you will get the sense that your mass too might be fine. It's uh, accelerating downward. But... Um, M1, it, the way among all the forces that's here, it says it's not accelerating anywhere, and you know that's wrong. And thinking about that is what will hopefully get you to think about this tension force. And once you are thinking about tension force, keep following it and realize there's tension force here as well. So there's a tension force on block one, and there's a tension force on block two. So let me draw those. I have tension force on block one, and tension force on block two, and I'm gonna draw it a little bit small to make sure that I realize that the direction of the net force here is going to be downward, just not as much as it might have been if there was no tension force. And uh, you might have noticed that I'm 
subscripting them with one and two. And a lot of people have tendency to simply say, oh, it's a tension force, the same, both of them, it's the one string. <laughs> and, you know, oftentimes in the scenarios you will see in this class, they do end up being the same. So um, that um, overly eager <laughs> identification of two forces, um, it won't result in serious error most of the time. Um, I just want you to highlight that uh, you do really need the the statement that the fully pulley is frictionless, um, so that so you know around this pulley you don't any net force or net torque to turn it, and actually in order for it to be possible to turn it without any net torque, it also has to be massless. It's a topic that we'll get to in a couple months when we do rigid body rotation and rotation inertia, but you need both of these conditions to be able to say my tension on one side of the pulley will be same as the tension on the other side of the pulley because I didn't need any imbalance of those forces to uh, allow the pulley to turn. So. Um, so with that, I'm just I am just gonna say t so that I don't overly complicate my equations. But you do need that justification to say that um, that you can just use one tension for both sides of the string. So okay, I've drawn free body diagrams, and I each step of the uh, drawing of free body diagram, I'm always asking this question: Did I draw all the forces? And, uh, and uh, up until now, the answer was no, because the direction of acceleration I was getting didn't match the acceleration that was given. But now, I think they all match. I can have M1 accelerating to the right, M2 accelerating downward. It looks all good. So my free body diagram is done. So now I need to define my coordinate axis. And coordinate axis, um, almost always, you want to define it so that your x direction is parallel to the anticipated direction of acceleration. And that means I would define my coordinate axis with my x direction going this way, and, um, and I guess y direction somehow perpendicular to that. And on my second free body diagram, if I'm being consistent with the direction of acceleration, also the direction of net force, then I would define my x axis this way. And y-axis, I could define it. Um, if I defined it, it'll go somewhere like this. And this is perfectly fine. Your axis for one diagram doesn't have to match the axis for the other diagram. Because really the, the purpose of the coordinate axis is to aid you in breaking forces into components and then later writing down Newton's second law equations. And since both of those are done within the free body diagram, you don't have to worry about if axes are consistent with other diagrams you've drawn. There's no need. So I've drawn, um, so I, I'll use these two axes, plus x going to the right for m1, plus x going downward for m2. That actually makes things the simplest. And the third step of breaking forces down into components, this is one easy part. I don't have to do anything because all the forces are already along x or y direction. So I can just put them into those bins of x and y, and I don't have to figure out the components. Um, um, so it's this is an easier question than usual. So uh, with all those done, now I have uh, step number four, uh, Newton's second law equation. Uh, so you need to write one equation per object, per dimension. So here you have two objects, two dimensions each. So potentially you have to write four equations. In the end, I'll probably end up writing only three because one of them I imagine being super boring. So, uh, so let me just write down one equation at a time and not skip steps. So first, my object M1, I'm going to have X direction for that. So for the X direction, uh, I'm going to have some acceleration, A1. And that acceleration will be given by the net force. Oh, just the tension, no other horizontal force tension divided by mass, and it's the mass of the object that I've drawn free body diagram for, so it should be m1 here. And I think that's it uh, for the x direction. For the y direction, um, the way I defined my axis, the acceleration in the y direction should be zero. Good. So zero is equal to, and I have um, the upward force, normal force, minus the downward force, m1g, divided by, again, the mass of the object, m1. 
Okay, let's keep going. I need my equation for uh, object number two. I have direction, x direction, um, which will be the acceleration. And um, I hope you have this sense that however fast this m1 is accelerating, the way they are connected by this string, that the magnitude of a1 will be equal to magnitude of a2. Otherwise, the length of the string will be changing. So here, I'm just going to use the same label, a1. Or let me actually do it the other way. Um, so I'm going to use different label, a2. And when I use the computer algebra system, I can actually handle that. I can handle the fact that a1 is equal to a2. I can add this as one of the equations. So I'll do it that way. So my acceleration of block 2 is equal to, uh, I need to... Um, the downward force in the plus x direction, m2g minus the upward force in the minus x direction, t, all of that divided by m2, mass of the thing I drew free body diagram for. And in the y direction, the equation is actually super boring. The acceleration in that direction is zero. And there are no forces in that direction, so net force is zero. So you get zero is equal to zero. I don't think I'm going to bother writing down this equation. It's you know, obvious topology of an equation. So I don't actually have to do anything. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I hate UI designers. Um, I think they did this thing where if you do squiggly thing, it becomes an eraser. I didn't want that behavior. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, so this is where we are at. At the end of the standard strategy, you have your system of equations. So I have one, to three equations, and I'm hoping I have only um, three unknown. Let's count and see. I have A1, that's unknown, one. I have tension, that's unknown, two. I have normal force, that's unknown, three. Um, I have A2, that's another unknown, four. And this is why you need this equation as your fourth equation if you choose to label A1 and A2 separate. So I'll include this as my fourth equation so that I have four equations, four unknowns. And you might be wondering that um, if you are looking at the force-oriented portion of the question, acceleration and tension, they are only asking you about two, two things, acceleration and tension. Why do we have four unknowns? Even counting the fact that we uh, labeled the acceleration as separate, we should have only three. And the reason for that is the normal force here. They are not asking you for it. You actually don't really need it. But we do have an equation that deals with it. So you could scratch it out and just forget about it. But let me actually include it because I'm just going to do this using computer algebra system. So writing one more equation is not that big of an extra work. So let me just uh, program this whole thing into SageMath and just to let SageMath handle it. I am not going to have to worry about um, so having to deal with one additional equation, it's not going to be that big of a deal. So let me just do it. I'm going to uh, first define all the variables I'll need to use. A1, T, M1, N. Uh, yeah, capital N, I think is fine. M1, G. I'm trying to think through if I'm overriding any uh, sage math of with internal functions. Uh, I have M1. Oh, I have one M1 twice. You don't want that. Um, I have M2, I already have T, and I already have M2. Oh, I need A2. Okay, that's all the variables. Uh, let's define all my equations. Equation 1 is A1 is equal to, uh, distinguishing the assignment symbol from equal to symbol, T divided by M1. Equation 2, my uh, 0 is equal to N minus M1 times G divided by M1. Equation 3 is equal to A2 is equal to M2 times G minus T divided by M2. Uh, equation 4 is equal to A1 is equal to A2. Good. And let me just to make sure my uh, system of equations look the way it should. Yeah, A equation 1, 2. It's done some factoring of minus sign. That's fine. A2, um, and good. 
So I'm going to use the solve function. I've shown the internal documentation for that. Um, so it, it's, this is my system of equations. Let me copy and paste that. And even though you might be tempted to ask for just the accelerations and tension, if you do that, it'll error out. Uh, Sage Math really needs um, the precisely, it doesn't need it doesn't want underdefined or overdefined the system if you only tell the system that you have three unknowns and have four equations it'll flip out so i need to tell it okay give me no more forces well i don't know it i don't need it but i'll just have you solve for it so let me put that into solutions variable and then print out solutions variable when it's done oh wow that was quick okay yeah that's my solution for a1 a2 which is equal to a1 um and tension and uh, yeah normal force again which i don't need so let me say solution one is the solutions it's a list of lists so i'm gonna say the zeroth first element for the first set of solutions and then the first element for a1 and that will be my acceleration and my solution two will be the tension so that will be again the first set of solutions and the third element zero one two um so yeah, yeah let me do that and then print solution one and solution two good now i can just uh, plug in the uh, numbers for solution one i'm substituting it g equal to 9.8 meter per second squared m1 of 5.4 kilogram m2 of 0 0.6 kilogram they are all in basic si unit so i should get an answer in basic si unit unit meter per second squared and um oh wow that's surprisingly all right i, I guess that that is correct <laughs> it surprised me because i didn't expect such a factor of 10 difference but i think the way the m1 and m2 worked out here that is how it should be so and tension um yeah tension same tension for both is 5.29 okay so let me um plug that in so i have part c but the part c requires a different approach so uh, let me do these two parts first 0 0.98 and 5.29 and then we'll do part c after verifying that these are correct so to answer part c you do need the acceleration of the blocks so um so it's Great that I now know the acceleration we got is correct. So with that, um, you have hanging mass hits the floor starting from rest and it's initially located 0 0.5 meter from the floor. So, um, so what that picture kind of looks like is um, if you have floor here, then the initial height, let me label that capital H is 0 0.5 meter so i hope you, um, this uh, recalls you back to kinematics and it gives you enough of a recall with the kinematics that uh, given the acceleration of the object that you know uh, given the initial speed that you also know uh, given the displacement that it's enough of information for you to think of the v squared formula which says the final speed squared is equal to initial speed squared plus two times acceleration times delta x. And these are vector quantities. You have to be mindful of their relative directions. Here, the acceleration and delta x happens to be in the same direction. So this is going to be a positive quantity. So once you think this far, then I think uh, oh, I can do this. Uh, in my head. So final speed will be square root of initial speed squared plus 2 times acceleration times delta x. And let me do the plugging in of numbers in uh, Sage Math. So in Sage Math, I'm going to first write out this expression. Let me define my, my variables. V final, V initial. I know it's going to be 0. I'll just uh, deal with that. And I'll just use A1. Um, yeah, now, let me just use A actually, not make things complicated. And uh, for delta x, I'll use H. So with that, I can just uh, write out the expression, uh, square root of, for V final, 
Oh, I didn't need to define wave funnel. It's going to be square root of v initial squared plus 2 times acceleration times delta x, which will be h. And this is a nice symbolic expression. And I can take it and substitute in all the quantities. h, I'm given as 0 0.5 meters. Acceleration, uh, there are some ways to programmatically use this. But since it's so simple, let me just copy and paste it to save labor save unnecessary neighbor and uh, my initial velocity is zero so that plugs in everything uh, this is uh, one way of plugging in numbers that in my opinion minimizes chances of mistake sometimes uh, when i do things on calculator i you know press the wrong key do whatever um, just uh, doing it this way it allows you to one uh, double check your symbolic expression make sure that it appears correct and two, um, the step of plugging numbers is simple. It's a matter of the split, the specifying what the numerical parameters are. So 0 0.98, okay, I'm gonna round that to 0 0.99. It'll still be within 1%. So 0 0.99, um, 0 0.99 meter per second. So with that, that's uh, all the uh, parts to this question. Um, and yeah, again, we have a lab that's exactly like this. So hopefully, I hope you get enough practice uh, working on a question like this. This is the type of multi-block scenario that I want everyone in this class to be able to solve. Not through having memorized the answers, but through um, having done enough of this that you feel comfortable um, approaching these multi-block, multi-step problem-solving strategy.